Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 9, and uh, we won't be before you long, but we're going to wrap up this series that we've been on over the last few Wednesday nights entitled The Harvest, and uh, reminding us that uh, we have our first big day of the year coming up in both locations, which is uh, Easter Sunday morning, Resurrection Sunday, however you want to refer to it. But we've been promoting our Each One Reach One campaign. Everyone's inviting people to come to church. Uh, and Luke 14, 23 has been our basis for that uh, 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 desire. Jesus said, go into the highways and hedges to compel them to come in because I want my house filled. Amen. I want my house filled. And so that's this Sunday morning. We're excited about it. The Lord said to me some time ago, He said, when a church gets a heart for the harvest, they'll get God's attention. When a church gets a heart for the harvest, they'll get God's attention. And Jesus said in Matthew 9 and uh, verse 37 and 38, very familiar passage of Scripture. But Jesus said, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And we've made the statement over the weeks that we've been teaching on this, that Jesus is not using this as a hammer to beat people up like sometimes it's ministered in church. You know, there's people going to hell and a bunch of lazy Christians aren't doing anything. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look at the harvest. Look how big it is. And he's saying, in relation to the harvest, the laborers are relatively few. So what you need to do is pray the Lord of the harvest, the Father, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And not only pray that he would send forth laborers into his harvest, but be willing to be a laborer that somebody prays for. Amen. Amen? And do you see this? So it's not that Jesus is saying the church isn't doing its job. I'm not one of those people that believes that about the church. I believe the church is alive and well. I believe the church is thriving and alive. Uh, uh, there's a wonderful book written by a wonderful pastor called The Local Church, The Hope of the World. A shameless plug, amen? But the, the, the point is, is, if you read that book, you'll see I, I believe that the church has amazing dignity. It has outstanding potential and power, amen? And what we have to do is just simply get a heart for the harvest and want to influence people with what has changed our lives. Amen? In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus says some things that we've been looking at. And He says in verse 13, You are the, light, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? And I want to keep reminding you, don't focus on what Jesus didn't focus on. His focus is you're the salt of the earth. Very often you'll hear, you know, well, we're supposed to be the salt of the earth, you know, and if the salt has lost its savor, that's not what you're supposed to be focusing on. We don't have any non-salty Christians in here. Amen. Everybody's salty. Amen. Tell your neighbor, I'm salty. I'm salty. Hallelujah. I'm salty. Then he went and he said, it's good for nothing but to be cast out and be uh, trodden underfoot of men. You are the light of the world. That's what we are. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine. So shine how? Like a city set on a hill. Amen. That's how bright it's supposed to be. Let your light shine that way in front of men. For what purpose? That they will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Is that what it says? The Message Bible says, let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors in the earth. So when, you know, the psalmist said this, that you could taste and see that God is good. How are people going to taste and see that God is good? Through the salt of the earth. 
We're the ones that bring out the God flavors in the world. We're the ones, that, and that's, that's got to be our focus. Listen, there's so many elements of the church, that, and people know what that element of the church is against. Listen, God's looking for people in the church that are going to talk about what they're for, what they believe in, not what they're against. Brother Hagin used to say this all the time. He would say, pastors need to teach their people what they're for and not what they're against. The way you bring out the God flavors in the earth is that people realize we have something worth tasting. We have something worth having. And if I'm consistently just telling people what I'm against and how bad things are, there's nothing good to taste. There's bad things going on in the earth, but there's good things going on in the earth. The harvest is white. The harvest is ready for us to reap it. Our job is to go be influence in the world. Amen? Hallelujah. Do you see this? Then he said, here's another way to put it. You're here to be light. And I like this, bringing out the God colors in the earth. Hallelujah. Bringing out the God colors in this world. So people are going to see what God looks like, acts like, and is like through the light of the world. Hallelujah. Amen. Then he said, notice, God's not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this. Not going to hide you under a bushel or under a bucket. I'm making you light bearers. The King James says, like a city set on a hill. And we've talked about this. The latter part of this in the, in the Message Bible says, keep open house. Be generous with your lives. Live big, open lives. God says that we're supposed to live such an open life and be so, so uh, uh, noticeable that it's like a city that is set on a hill. You know, we'll fly in from different places and, and Little Rock to a large extent, but especially when we fly into a big city, Los Angeles, Kansas City, Dallas, somewhere like that. You know, you have no trouble at night recognizing where you're at. Because that city is lit up. There, there's no darkness around it. That's, that's how Jesus says we're supposed to be. Like a city set on a hill. Right? So bright and so, so much influence coming out of us with the God colors in the earth and the taste of God in our life that we're influencing people because He said that this candlestick lights the whole house. And throughout Scripture, that house is representative of my life. It's representative of my influence. And Jesus said that the light in me should shine so brightly that it influences others around me. What is salt and light in its base definition? Influence. Salt influences food. Light influences darkness. Amen. We're, we are salt and light. We're supposed to influence the world that we live in. In John chapter 13... And we'll get into how to do that. Another aspect of how to do that. John chapter 13. Now notice this. We're salt and light. We're, we're influence. And we've talked about things in the way, the way believers hurt their influence. You know, when uh, I was uh, talking to uh, the guys tonight and Pastor Michelle was there and we were talking about, you know, being raised in church. And, you know, I made some mistakes and, and, and you know, got away from the Lord for a time. And I've told this story over and over again. And, you know, there was a, a, a dear lady at that time that, you know, was, was trying to uh, get me to see things straight. And she came up to me. She's a believer, wonderful woman, sweet woman. I mean, now I was raised classic Pentecostal. All right, and everybody that went to the Pentecostal church didn't believe God was good. I mean, they would sing, God is a good God, but they didn't really believe it. All right, and this, this lady might have been one of them, and she came up to me and she, she, she let me know real quick, and this is her exact words, you know, if God's got to wrap you around a telephone pole to get you to serve Him, He will. He'd rather have you serve Him paralyzed from the neck down than running around doing whatever you want to do. Well, you know, I've often said that just made, that influenced me, boy. It just made me want to run back to the church. You know, you know what really started me thinking back that pathway? My old youth pastor. He's in heaven today, Sammy Casadas. 
And man, I've, I've told you about the big Mercury that he drove. And I was walking down the street in Dowhart, Texas, bless its holy name, and, and, and going to see my girlfriend. And Sammy floated up beside me. Those big Mercuries, they didn't, they didn't drive, they floated. They were like a boat. <sighs> right? And uh, he stopped and said, hey, you want to ride? And I got in. And he knew I was doing some things that weren't right. And he just began to tell me how much God loved me. He began to tell me what a future I had, what a potential I had, right? He began to tell me that God still had a plan for my life. There was still an anointing on my life. Well, you know, I didn't just immediately turn everything around and run back where I was uh, after that conversation, but it influenced me. Yeah. It influenced me. Amen. Yeah. And, 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 and when I get to heaven, I'm, that's, that's one of the first people I'm going to look up because he influenced me. Amen. See, we, we have the amazing ability to influence people with our lives as believers. And, and the way that we do it, the way that we live our lives, the way that we act, the way we talk, the way we respond to things. I was, I was talking to the Kansas location the other night. And, and, you know, Jesus said, we read it there in Luke 6, it says, judge not and you won't be judged. Well, you know, the, the, the Woost Bible says, uh, don't use censorious criticism, right? And then you won't have it back on you. Well, that word censorious, it, it, it basically means this, to be harsh, to be overbearing, all right? To be mean-spirited. You know, there are things that are right and wrong in the world. Amen. There are things that are sin and things that are not sin. But you're not going to influence anybody by being harsh and mean-spirited and overbearing with them about the way they're living. Amen. Do, do, do you see that? You know, the, the, some of the big issues in, in the world today. You know, same-sex marriage, homosexuality, abortion. But listen, those are all not biblical. They're, they're all against the, the, the will of God. But we're not going to influence people with what we believe by being mean-spirited. I've heard preachers get up in the pulpit and say, let me tell you one thing, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. That's just mean-spirited. Hello? That's just mean-spirited. You're not going to influence anybody with that. Yeah, but bless God, they need to change what they're doing. Listen, if I can't influence them so they can see the God colors and taste the God flavors, how am I going to show them that what I have is better than what they have? Amen. Brother Hagin even said this. He said, even an old sow quit coming to the trough if you hit her with a stick every time she shows up. <laughs> Amen. But, but, but believers, I hear people say, well, bless God, I'm just not going to compromise. We're so concerned that if we are not just harsh about things, that we're compromising. It's not compromise if you don't agree with it and side in with it. L listen, listen. When Jesus went by the receipt of custom and told Matthew, come and follow me. Matthew is a tax collector, right? And it says Matthew went out and got all of his tax collector buddies, all of his publican buddies, all of his sinner buddies, and threw a big feast for Jesus. And it says Jesus went and was eating there and that they all resorted to Him. Now you know your Bible. Do, do we see Jesus saying all you tax collectors, all you publicans, all you sinners, you better turn or burn. No, we see the religious people saying what? Why does He eat with them people? And, of course, the disciples didn't know. They didn't have an answer. And Jesus said, here's why. He said, because it's not the whole that need a physician, it's the sick. And this is why the Son of Man came into the earth to seek and save that which was lost. And He told him, you need to understand what this scripture means. I desire mercy and not judgment. See, that's influence. That's influence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are, are you following me? That, that, that's influence. 
And, and is, it, is it any wonder? Those were the people that followed Jesus. Those were the people that Jesus said, they're going to go into the kingdom of God in front of the religious leaders. Because they're not concerned about influence, they're concerned about looking like they're better than. Amen. Well, in John 13, am I helping you so far? Verse 14, he said, If I then, your Lord and Master, I'm sorry, I meant verse uh, 34, excuse me. A new commandment I give unto you that you, here it is, love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. So Jesus said it was a commandment to walk in love towards one another. And he said people would know we're his, his disciples because we love each other. Right? Not because of the way we look, but because we love each other. Amen. Now, now granted, I mean... There, there's a way that we're supposed to conduct ourselves. But Jesus said the distinguishing factor would be love. Right? From what Jesus said, we can gather that the predominant factor in a Christian's life should be love. The predominant factor in a Christian's life should be love. Amen. Why? Love covers. Love protects. Love guards. Love causes my faith to work. But even where the world is concerned, the predominant factor, the predominant distinguishing characteristic of a believer should be love. And notice, we don't love because we're commanded to. We love because we want to please the Father. Amen. I used to know a minister that would stay in our house when I was a boy growing up, and he would tell people, well, I love you because I have to. Because I'm commanded to love you. Well, you know, that don't make you feel very loved. I love you because I have to. No, Jesus said, Jesus said that was how people would know we were his disciples, his followers. So how are people, how am I going to influence people with the gospel? Love. Amen. Look at, look at John chapter 13 and verse 1. John 13 and verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, notice this, he loved them until the end. The Amplified Bible says, He loved them to the last and highest degree. He loved them to the end. Jesus loved until the end. 1 Corinthians 13, what does it say? It's, it says that love suffers long. Love is patient. Love is kind. In other words, love goes the whole distance. Amen. Amen. Love goes the whole distance. You know, when, when, before we went into full-time ministry and I worked in corporate America, I, I, learned, I learned very early on that if people, if people knew how much you loved them, if they knew that you cared about them, they'd listen to you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. But they have to know. And I've got to love until the end. If I want to be influenced, I have to love somebody until they change. People say, well, they need to change. If they would change, I'd love them. No, you love them until they change. You love the change into them. Amen. Hallelujah. Over and over again, I've seen it. People, people, you know, just somebody just wants to be loved. We used to have a guy that would come to church in DeSoto, and he was the town drunk. Kansas, he was the town drunk. You know, some places still have town drunks. And, and DeSoto's small enough for them to have a, a town drunk. And you know what he would do? He would come to church, and he would stop by the plant, 
and take his beer out of his pocket and put it in the plant and come into church. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and he'd come find me every day after church, you know, and, and just breathing out these obnoxious fumes, right? Oh, Reverend, that was a good message. That was just a really good message, right? And then, and then he'd go out and the usher would open the door for him. He'd go back by the plant and get, get his beer out of the plant and head on down the road. Amen. Pastor Michelle and I were eating lunch one day in, at the, uh, one of the restaurants there in town. And, and he came in and I called his name. I said, come on over here and sit with us. And, you know, let, let me buy you, buy you lunch. You know, listen, the, the, the issue is, is it's not loving the town drunk just to love the town drunk. Jesus said, this is how people will know you're my disciples. This is how you're going to bring out the God colors in the earth. Right? Amen. Man, he sat down there and ate with us. Our son came in, came in to eat with us, and he looked, he looked at me and, Dad, what are you doing? You know, but 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 the 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 point is, is you love them till the end. We we've, we've been able to have an impact on that family. We've been able to have an impact on his brothers. We've been able to have an impact because why? You love until the end. It's influence. Am I making sense? So Jesus loved. Until the end. Luke chapter 19. Luke 19. And that's why we've got to be careful, even in our political climate, guys. Listen to me. We've got to be careful. We've we, we got to be careful that we don't violate that law of love. Amen. 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 We've got to be careful that we don't violate that law of love in the name of security, in the name... We can't violate the law of love. Right is right and wrong is wrong. There's, listen to me. I'll be very blunt. There's a way to come into the nation and there's a way to not come into the nation. But I'm, I'm here to tell you. I was sitting with a group of pastors one time. And uh, one pastor uh, is a, a, a family member. Well, both of these pastors actually are family members of mine. And uh, one of them pastors a largely, predominantly African American church. And this was right after uh, Mr. Obama had been elected. And he was talking to this other pastor about how he had to be cautious about what he talked about. Now listen to me. Because he said, I, you know, I have quite a few people in my church that voted for Mr. Obama. Well, this other minister, he just, he's one of these guys, you know, you just bless God, you tell it like it is. He said, you got to stand for what's right. Omitting influence. I'm not talking about sugarcoating or compromising, but there's a way to do things where you're influenced. Amen. And, and then he was talking to me, and, and at that time, uh, Constructores de Fe in DeSoto, it was, I, I, we, were, we were running a number, a good number of people, and, and many of them had come into the country illegally, and I knew it. And this other minister said, well, you got to say something about that. And I looked at him and I said, no law or government will ever dictate to me who I'm allowed to show the love of God to. Influence. A Amen. Influence. We got to be careful with that. I I'm a Christian first and an American second. Are you with me? I'm a Christian first and an American second. There, there has, this has to be the guiding principle of my life. Yes. Amen. Luke 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which was lost. One translation says He's come to find and restore the lost. Find and restore. Now, now think about that just in the church. Somebody falls, somebody makes a mistake, somebody gets into error. The Bible says that the goal there is restoration. Paul said in the book of Galatians, he said, If a brother be, uh, if a brother be overtaken in a fall, you who are spiritual, restore him. What is the number one sign of spirituality? The ability to walk in love. Not speaking in tongues, not prophesying, not having a word of wisdom, Word of knowledge, yay, yay, yah, yah, yo, yo. That, no, that's not, that, right? 
That's not a sign of the, the number one sign of spirituality. Number one sign of spirituality is the ability to walk in love. The ability to love other people. Amen. And he said the goal was seek and save. Very often people talk about the scripture in Corinthians where Paul said, uh, you know, about the man that was cohabitating with his, uh, uh, his stepmother. Paul said, look, you've done wrong that you didn't put him out. Right? Well, you know, in our day and age, we, we'd put it like this. You know, she was probably working in the children's ministry and, and you know, he was singing in the choir, you know, and, and everybody was saying, well, you know, but they're doing so good. We don't want... Paul said, no, 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 no. They're, they're living in open sin. You should have put them out. But what did he say in his next letter? He said, I've forgiven him. Evidently, he's changed. And Paul said, you ought to restore him. Now, that, now, no matter how you slice it, picking up with your stepmom is gross. That's bad. Right? Amen. But Paul said, okay, he's repented. You need to forgive him. Restore him. Why? That's influence. That's influence. People, listen... People will remember your forgiveness far more than they'll remember anything else. Amen. This is the attitude of love. Matthew chapter 9. I'm hurrying as much as I can. Matthew 9, verse 35. When Jesus went about the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was, here it is, moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Notice what Jesus did. He had compassion on them. Had compassion on them. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. We're talking about being influenced. Matthew 14 and verse 13. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them. And he healed their sick. John the Baptist has just been beheaded. Jesus has just heard about it. All right, he goes to get away from all the, the clamor and the turmoil and the, and the crowd, and the crowd follows him. And notice what Jesus didn't do. He didn't come out and say, look, I'm going through a really hard time right now. I don't have time to do this today. You know, I don't, I don't have time to minister to people. He saw the hurting people. He saw the sick people. He saw those that had no hope, and he was moved with compassion. Jesus was influence personified. He was able to look past what he's dealing with and show the love of God. In Matthew 15, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 52. Matthew 15. I said 52, 32. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now these three days and have nothing to eat. Notice, I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. Love was Jesus' motivating factor. I will not send them away fasting. I won't send them away this way. It's not my will. That's, that's the attitude of Jesus. Remember what the Bible says in the book of uh, 2 Peter? It says that God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to the knowledge of eternal life. And that's why He put us in the world as salt and light, as influence, so that we can influence people with the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the greatness of God. Hallelujah. In John chapter 8. John chapter 8. This will be our last scripture. And uh, verse 12.
Now, to give you the backstory, you'll remember this is, this is when uh, they brought the woman caught in the very act of adultery to Jesus. And uh, they said, Moses in the law says she should be stoned. What do you say? And uh, Jesus, you'll remember, began to bent down on the ground, begin to write in the dirt. People say, well, what was he writing? Well, Jeremiah says prophetically that he was writing the names of his accusers in the dirt. That's, that's what Jeremiah says, so that's what I believe. But the, the point is, regardless of what you believe he was writing, he was writing something. And then he looked up and gave him his verdict. You who are without sin, cast the first stone. Right? And then he bent down and kept writing. And the Bible says that they were all, beginning from the young, uh, oldest to the youngest, convicted in their conscience, and they all left. And then Jesus, we'll pick it up here, when Jesus, verse 11, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw uh, none but the woman, he said, woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned you, judged you, criticized you? And she said, notice, no man, Lord. In other words, they didn't carry out the sentence, they didn't carry out the verdict. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you, but she sinned. She was caught in the very act. Why didn't Jesus warn her? Why didn't he, why didn't he give her a comeuppance and explain to her how wrong she had been? Because Jesus was influenced. For this woman to change her life, she has to see something more powerful than what she's had. He told her, go and sin no more. Then notice what he said. Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus didn't condemn this woman. He showed love to her. Love doesn't condemn. It's not harsh. Love forgives. Amen. Tell your neighbor, said, just for future reference, I forgive you. Amen. Hallelujah. I forgive you. Love does not condemn. Love forgives. Love's not harsh. Love's not mean-spirited. Love forgives. Jesus is showing us something here. He's showing faith builders, showing our churches the pattern for being the light of the world. Love. That's the pattern for being the light of the world, is love. When, when, when I make a determination to do my best to love every person that comes into my life, now I'm, now I'm, now I'm influenced. Now I'm influencing people. I've had people over the years, one gentleman asked me one time, there was a couple that, that came, came back to the church. And you know, they had left the church at one time, and they came back to the church. And you know, when, when they left, they didn't leave quietly. You know, they left saying, you know, airing their grievances and, and saying different things. And we've never had church splits, but we have had some people leave. Well, they came back and met with me and asked me if they could come back. And I said, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can come back. I mean, uh, come on. And the guy looked at me and he said, how can you do that? And it just came out of me. I said, it's always better to give the wrong man a break than break the wrong man. That's just it. It's always better to give somebody a chance and be influenced than be the person that's just willing to write everybody off. That's a very lonely life. Amen? And the more people see that you love, and the more people see that you're compassionate, and the more pe people see that you're not harsh and mean-spirited. I'm not talking about not telling the truth. You know, I've had people tell me things before and then say, now you agree with me? Uh-uh, no, <laughs> not at all. I don't agree at all. But nicely, because it's okay to disagree. It's the spirit you disagree in. Hallelujah. You know, I laughed some time ago. Uh, 
the president of Chick-fil-A, you know, Mr. Kathy's son now, uh, you know, they, they, they had all this stuff out about Chick-fil-A and, and how they were homophobic and all these different things. And, but then it came out that the, the president of one of the leading uh, homosexual groups was very good friends with Mr. Kathy and had actually even been invited to the Super Bowl with him and he sat in his box and, and they had a really good relationship and he said, no, he's made his views completely plain to me but he's not mean-spirited and he's nothing like they're trying to paint him to be. You know, that hit me. He's influence. That's influence. I'm not going to get everybody saved that I witness to. I'm not going to win everybody that I talk to about the Lord to, I'm not going to seal the deal, close the deal, if you will, but I can be influence. Your neighbors need, if they don't know anything else about you, they need to know you're nice. Amen. Right? Yeah. My family members need to know that I'm nice because, you know, we all got them cousins. <laughs> right? Everybody's got that cousin. And, and, and even that cousin needs to know we're nice. We, why? We have something. And I'll, I'll close with this. I've had people over the years come up to me and they'll say, there's just, there's just something about you. You're, just, you're not like the other people. Well, I learned, I learned a long time ago, if I can influence people with the gospel, it's only the good news if I can influence them with it. And the Bible says in the book of Romans, he said, do you not know this, that it's the goodness of God that leads men to repent? Amen. Amen. We are salt and we're light. And Jesus gave us the pattern. Jesus gave us the way to be salt and light, to be influenced, is to walk in love, to not be harsh, to not be mean-spirited. Amen. Because listen, peop people are going to come to our churches. People are going to come to our churches and they're going to look different. They're going to smell different. They're going to act different. People are going to come to our churches. They don't know what it means to live like a Christian's supposed to live. You know, some of I was, I was saved when I was eight years old. I don't know anything but church. I know all the churchisms. I know all of the, I know all of the faithisms. I know all of the songs. I mean, I sang out of the red hymnal, okay? I, I know, right? And the green one. I went to the Church of God sometimes. We sang out of the green hymnal. <laughs> now the assembly, we sang out of the red hymnal. Amen. But the, 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 <laughs> the, 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 the point is, the point is there's going to be people don't know what a hymnal is. We got to influence them with the goodness of Jesus Christ. So you take the rest of this week and influence people. Influence people on your job. Influence people in your neighborhood. Influence your family members. I've told you, if you got to offer to buy them lunch, hey, I'll buy you lunch Sunday. Come to church with me, I'll buy you lunch. Everybody will come for a free, uh, a, a free donut. Amen. Buy them a Starbucks or a Dunkin' Donuts or whatever, wherever you get your coffee at. But the point is, be influenced. Amen. And they'll appreciate you for it. Yes. Amen. Well, stand up, everybody. Praise God. Now, I just want you to be sure and look at your clock. I can preach a 30-minute sermon. <laughs> Don't get comfortable with that, but I can do it. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody told me the other day, I, we got out of, out of a Sunday night service by 7.30. And I said, see, there we're out by 7.30. Somebody came to me after church and said, well, can you do something about Sunday morning? <laughs> No, I can't. I don't want to influence you wrongly. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Guys, we appreciate it again so much. Thank you for being here and your wonderful spirit and wonderful anointing. We're so grateful. Amen. Be sure and shake their hands tonight and tell them how much you appreciated what they did for us. God's so good. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, Sunday morning, of course, we'll be back at 6 o'clock. Uh, 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock Sunday night. 10 a.m. Sunday morning. Amen. Resurrection Sunday morning. And God's going to meet us and do some wonderful things. Amen. Well, come on, say it with me. The vision of this church is to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you.